um, just a weekly update and catch up with you. Today's focus is going to be on um, processing JobKeeper payments within the zero environment. Um, we are working on connecting you with at least recordings across each of the common softwares that you will see out there. And we're, uh, and we'll also have this recording on the website to you, for you to refer back to as well. So that um, ultimately by hopefully early next week, you'll have um, a suite of the softwares uh, recorded and available for you to refer to. Um, I'll just say to those of you who are still waiting for responses from me, um, for emails that have been sent in, I thank you for your patience. Um, in some instances, I'm actually waiting to hear back from the ATO for clarification on certain things. Um, and in, <laughs> in other instances, I just haven't gotten to the emails as yet because there have been quite a few to deal with. So again, thanks for your patience. Um, I will get through all of them eventually. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Cass, who's going to take you through processing um, payroll in zero. I guess just one other admin item, and that is um, if we can keep today's focus on the zero. I know there are so many other questions associated with the, the pieces of legislation, but the purpose of today is to focus on processing the payroll in zero. So thanks, Cass. Over to you. Hi, everyone, and thanks for taking the time out to um, join us here again today. As Rochelle has indicated, the focus of today's webinar is going to be about processing the um, JobKeeper payrolls through Xero. Um, so I'm working on the assumption that, that you're all fairly familiar with Xero um, and how it operates and, and how the, the payroll processing happens normally anyway. Um, a couple of things I do want to touch on before we start getting into the mechanics of, of processing payroll. Um, a fabulous tool has been released from Xero around uh, turnover calculators. So obviously before you can start to process payroll in Xero for JobKeeper purposes, uh, the business needs to determine whether or not they meet the eligibility requirements to be an eligible employer. Um, Xero have kindly developed a JobKeeper turnover calculator that you can actually start to use as a basis for um, reviewing whether or not your client's turnover actually meets the fall that is required to deem them to be eligible. So with this turnover calculator, and you will find that in this file, the numbers are a little bit funky because there is no 219 data to compare against. But essentially what it's giving you the option to do is look at the month of March and to determine whether you want to choose to review on either a cash or an accruals basis. And then you just simply um, change it and the figures will update. Now in a situation where you don't have um, 219 or prior year figures for whatever reason, you can actually manually enter those in here. So if you've popped 25,000, you can see how it's telling you what the change is. Um, and if this was a, a live client, they would obviously be eligible for JobKeeper because the decline is, is down past um, 30%. You can actually also have a look at the transactions that sit behind the eligibility criteria as well. Um, and just make sure that you've got your transactions coded uh, because it will be picking up GST on income and GST free transactions. So if there's anything that should actually be input tax, you may need to find and recode prior to that. So as I said, you can have a look at it on accruals or a cash basis, and you can actually have a look at it over the quarters. So for the first JobKeeper reporting period, which is um, April, the tests are against um, March 2020 actuals versus March 2019 act actuals, projected April 2020 against um, April 2019 act actuals, or projected April to June, versus actual April to June 2019. So you've got a number of different um, ways that you can look at it. So I'm not going to labour on that terribly much. We're going to jump into uh, the demo now for processing payroll. Um, again, one of the things that you will still need to ensure you've done is actually registered your client through either the online services for agents um, and finalised that before you are going to be processing payroll or alternatively your client may have registered themselves uh, directly through their business portal. Can I just jump in there with a query from um, Susan? She was wondering whether you can 
publish that turnover report to um, keep within their file? No, at this point you can't publish it, but what I would recommend that you do if you are planning to use it for um, working paper purposes, oops, I've just jumped into the wrong report then. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm just pulling that off for a sec. There we go. Uh, what you can do is you can screen snap it. So what I would do once um, we've got the figures for the client, I would just pull a screen snap and then save that as part of the working papers once you've got your results on there. And then that's actually a document I send to clients and ask them to formally sign off on it as well as putting some narratives around it and some other, other language. So no, you can't publish it yet. Um, they've put this together and you know fairly quick and quickly over the last week. Um, and publishing is probably not on their radar at this point in time. Uh, so moving forward, looking at the payroll processing. So the first step in payroll processing in Zero for JobKeeper is just coming into the settings and the payroll settings. Now, many of you may have heard um, things discussed about Fortnite Start, FN1, FN2, JobKeeper Start, which is what some of the other software applications are using. But Xero has actually been great in that they have um, set up a lot of that to be hard coded in the, the background. So what we're going to do is move to payroll settings and Xero have set up a specific pay item that can be used and it's called JobKeeper Payment Top Up. It's mapped to an allowance and I'll just open that up for you. It's mapped to an allowance. It's set as a fixed rate. Um, it's mapped to the wages expense account. Uh, it's flagged as being exempt from superannuation guarantee. And it's also flagged as being reportable on W1. So if you weren't sure, um, any JobKeeper payments are taxed at the employee's marginal rates. So that's why we haven't um, exempted it from PAYG withholding. Now, some of you may have actually uh, set JobKeeper payment top up allowances up or, or pay items up prior to Xero having rolled this out. Um, if you've already set up an allowance and it's actually mapped to one of the other allowance types, you can simply edit that allowance and make sure it's remapped back to the Xero created JobKeeper payment top ups. And the reason you would need to do that is because this is actually hard coded in the back end to report correctly through single touch payroll. Similarly, if you've perhaps used an ordinary time earnings, um, what you can do is actually do an unscheduled pay run to move the information from the ordinary hours or the ordinary time earnings code that you set up into the zero created um, JobKeeper payment, payment top up code. Now in a situation where you might be uh, have wages being pointed to more than one general ledger code, so perhaps the business needs to, to track wages expense against overheads and then um, production or cost of goods, you can quite easily set up a second allowance code. Simply pick up the JobKeeper on top ups, um, JobKeeper top up, um, COGS if you like, or whatever you wanna call it. Um, give it the display name, again, fixed amount, and again, map it to the relevant wages account if you've got more than one wages account. Now, there are some situations or, or there is discussion that um, is superannuation calculated on JobKeeper top-ups. So where it's a top-up scenario, superannuation is optional. So if you have an employer who has made the decision to include superannuation on a JobKeeper top-up, you will need to have a JobKeeper top-up code where exempt from superannuation guarantee contribution hasn't been flagged. Now at this point in time, I've actually not come across any businesses that have, have been generous enough to say, yes, we will pay um, SG on top of the, the top-up. Um, so, you know, and, and if you come across it, please um, set that up accordingly. The other thing that I'll make very, very clear is there's actually a difference um, when we're talking about JobKeeper. A, a lot of people are actually saying, oh, $1,500, but what if the employee is working um, or on annual leave? 
And as we step through some of the working examples, we'll explain um, the rationale and logic around those and why it sits in, in a different part of the payslip. So Xero's pretty much already done this. It's live in all of the organisations that have payroll. Um, and unless you've got anything more that you need to do with the, um, the JobKeeper pay item, um, it's pretty much set and forget in there. So what we're going to do now is move over to actually paying employees. And we've got a, a draft pay run here and I'm just going to reset that pay run. I'm pretty sure it's okay, but we'll just um, reset it anyway. So how do we now process a payroll for an employee with JobKeeper on it? And um, how do we pick up any top ups or, or what are the different scenarios that we're going to be looking at? So I'm gonna have a look at James Lebron here. And when we have a look at James, uh, we can see that James is working the 76 hour fortnight. So he's still fully employed. There's no issues there. And you can see that his total gross wage is actually in excess of $1,500. Um, there is actually nothing more that you need to do with that. And I'm just gonna jump back because I did miss a critical step. And I must apologize on that. So if you do come through to the payroll, click through to your payroll support page. And what we need to do before we process the payroll, sorry, is enroll the employees in Xero. And Xero, again, has done some great work with this. So um, obviously there are a number of criteria around what is, is deemed to be an eligible employee. So casual employees have got to be in place over 12 months, uh, regular and systematic. Uh, normal employees were needed to have been employed at the 1st of March, over 16 years of age. So Xero is actually um, testing some of those um, eligibility requirements automatically. And it will flag to you whether or not it believes any of your employees are eligible or potentially eligible or not eligible. So in this scenario here, um, Xero is actually saying that all of these employees are potentially eligible. Um, I'm going to work on the assumption that they all are for, for the training purposes, but obviously if you're working in a live organisation, make the decisions that are actually relevant to your organisation. And what you simply do for each employee is click on where it says start JobKeeper. And then you're determining in which fortnight the JobKeeper um, payments or JobKeeper top ups are actually going to be made. Now we're working in the initial period at the moment, the period of um, commencing on the 30th of March. So most employees, if they are uh, deemed to be eligible employees, will be commencing from the fortnight on the, of the 30th of March. Now, obviously, if you've got a, a business that for whatever reason has different circumstances and the employees are only going to be commencing from the 13th of March, um, please se select that one. But we will be working on the premise that they'll all be starting on the um, 30th of March. Now, um, must make this really, really clear. Once this has been saved, it can't be undone. You actually need to contact Xero to have anything reversed out that's been put through um, incorrectly. So my advice is to actually take care and, and you know check it a couple of times just to make sure you're correct before you do hit save for reporting. The other thing that you'll see here is how Xero is picking up the, the FN codes that we've probably heard about. So these are the pieces of information that are actually being sent to the ATO as part of the STP submission um, that tells the ATO that A, this employee is um, an eligible employee for JobKeeper purposes, and this is the fortnight in which they became eligible for JobKeeper purposes. And that will obviously be matched back with the monthly reports that will need to be lodged and that is then going to trigger the payment to the ATO. So we're gonna say that James is definitely an eligible employee uh, we're going to say that this person, a debt, is an eligible employee. Um, we'll do all of those. Okay, so we've done four eligible employees here. Now, if at some point during the, um, the, the employee's engagement with the employer, the employment relationship is terminated. So the employee may have resigned, there may have been a redundancy paid, there, there's, they've been terminated for whatever reason. You do need to come back into uh, zero and stop the JobKeeper payment. And when you do that, you're actually going to be asked in which period does the employee um, stop being eligible for JobKeeper payments. 
So at the moment, we're, we've only got the two periods that are currently open available to us, but as you start to move through each of the payment periods, um, more periods will become available to you. So we're not going to stop anybody at the moment um, because we do want them to be uh, processed in pay runs. And if you have a look here, you can actually go uh, to have a look at the employee record. I'm not going to jump into that at all. And the other thing too for you is it's very easy to test this yourself and have a practice and apply on it in the demo file. If you're a little bit tentative about stepping into it directly into a client organisation. So we're just working straight out of the demo company here at the moment. So going back to processing payroll, we jump into payroll and we come into the pay runs. And we'll go into James now. Now, one of the big changes you will notice is for each of the employees in a pay run who is enrolled and eligible, you'll now see this piece of information sitting here on the top right hand of the screen. So that's really handy if you are uh, processing a, a payroll that's got multiple employees and perhaps some of them for whatever reason uh, weren't deemed to be eligible at the time. Um, and, you know, if you're going through and updating records, you know that they don't necessarily need a top up for that particular pay period because they're actually not being flagged as, as enrolled. So as I was saying previously with James, he's working 76 hours a week and his gross wage is already $1,500 for the fortnight or in excess of $1,500 for the, the fortnight. We don't need to do anything more for James at all. Um, we don't need to include the JobKeeper top up line. A number of people have said, oh, do I need to include that line with $0 in it? No, you don't need to do that. You just simply accept that he's already um, flagged as a gross of more than $1,500. You've still got deductions here. PAYG is being um, calculated at marginal rates. You've got superannuation. Ignore the super percentage here. It's wrong in the demo file. We all know it should be nine and a half percent. We've got salary sacrifice working in here as well. And his leave is actually still accruing. So with James, he's already earning more than 1500, nothing more to do. So what we're going to do is we uh, move on to Oliver. Now, Oliver's pay template is currently set up for him to be on 76 hours. But for whatever reason, Oliver has actually only worked um, 38 hours during this particular fortnight. Now, it's possible that um, Oliver was a part-time employee. Um, so his normal hours would have only been 38 hours over this fortnight. Um, however, JobKeeper says that he still needs to be receiving $1,500. So what we're going to do there is add JobKeeper line in. If we click on that, we select the JobKeeper payment top up and we just simply increase that by $360, which now shows that Oliver is earning the minimum of $1,500, which is required as part of the JobKeeper um, subsidy program. You can see that Oliver's still got leases, so that's fine for those still to be um, deducted. Um, you can see that tax is actually being calculated on the $1,500, not just on the $1,140. And the superannuation is only going to be calculated on the ordinary hours, not on the JobKeeper payment top up. Now down here, um, and, and again, please understand we're working in a demo file, um, assuming that um, Oliver's leave uh, had been set up in his leave record to accrue based on ordinary hours. So I know that this one is actually set to accrue based on fixed hours, but accrue based on ordinary hours, annual leave would continue to accrue just on the 38 hours. It doesn't accrue on ele any element of a JobKeeper payment top up. Now, another scenario may come into play where instead of um, only being a part-time worker, Oliver is actually a full-time worker and works for 76 hours a, a fortnight, um, but he has been formally stood down for the other 38 hours. So under um, the legislation that passed, the JobKeeper subsidy legislation, there were some changes that were made to the Fair Work Act that enabled a JobKeeper-enabled stand down. So for an employee like Oliver that, Oliver that was working for 76 hours, um, the business is now able to provide him with 38 hours worth of work. For the balance of those 38 hours, he's being formally stood down. Now under stand down provisions, an employee is eligible to uh, accrue annual leave on those stand down hours. Um, and if during a period of stand down, there are any public holidays, 
and those public holidays fall on a day that would ordinarily be worked by the employee, then the employee must be paid for those public holidays. So what we're going to do is step through that scenario here. So I'm just going to take out the JobKeeper line at the moment. So the first thing we may need to do in a stand down situation, if you don't have it already, is actually add in a new payroll setting, and a new payroll pay item. And in this instance, stand down is actually ordinary time earnings. And we know with stand down, based on what we were saying, that we do want to continue to accrue leave. So when we're working with stand down as an ordinary time earnings, we're making it a multiple of an employee's ordinary earnings rate. And that gives us the ability to accrue leave on that earnings rate. Stand down is a multiplier of zero because when an employee is stood down, unless they're working public holidays, um, it will be zero, um, they, they won't be receiving any pay. And you would match that to your wages and salaries, even though there are, um, there won't be anything being posted through as part of the pay run. Um, again, here, you don't need to do anything here because a stand down will resolve in nil, nil value going through to the pay run. So we're just going to add that in. I'm just going to jump back to Oliver and I'll just reset this pay slip so we can see how this now steps through. So Oliver um, was normally a full-time employee working 76 hours, but we know that he's actually now only working the 38 hours. We now need to flag that the balance of those 38 hours are actually stand down hours. And you can see we've now got the 76 hours across the fortnight, but it's being the balance of 38 is, is zero. Um, but we still need to do the JobKeeper top up. We bring this in here and we add that in as $360 to bring up to the, um, the $1,500. And again, everything flows through as it should. And again, in this instance, if leave had been set to accrue based on ordinary hours, it would have accrued leave on the full 76 hours, not just the 38 hours that was actually in the, um, the ordinary hours. Now I'm going to add a little bit of a twist on this as well, and that relates to public holidays. So um, during this stand down period, uh, there actually fell a public holiday. And going back on the, the statement we made earlier where an employee who is on stand down does need to be paid for public holidays. Now there's a couple of different ways you could do that. And if you're using zero and you have um, under your payment settings, uh, sorry, under each employee's payment record. So I'll just jump into one of the pay, uh, employee records. If you include holidays in pay slips and obviously make sure it's mapped to the correct holiday group, when you are looking at the employee's pay slip, it will identify specifically the public holiday that's there. We haven't got that for Oliver, um, but we know that he's taken, there was a public holiday during this pay period and he's entitled to be paid 7.6 hours for that public holiday. You could quite easily just increase the um, ordinary hours by 7.6 hours and that would decrease the stand down hours also by 7.6 hours as well. Or you could add another ordinary hours line in if you wanted to. And sometimes that might be the easiest. $30 an hour and then reduce the 38 down by 7.6, which gives us 30.4 hours of stand down time. Now you can see in this instance that because of the public holiday, we now need to just change the JobKeeper top up. So 1500 minus the 1368 gives us $132 that actually needs to be topped up for this particular employee for this particular pay, pay period. Um, again, you know, all of these things with deductions, salary sacrifice if it's in there, superannuation. So super will calculate on the public holiday component, it will calculate on the ordinary hours, but again, won't calculate on the JobKeeper payment top up. So we'll just save that and move on to the next employee. So Sally's our next employee um, and Sally we're just going to say is a, is a casual employee and for whatever reason this period there's actually been no working hours and in this situation 
there is just a simple top up to the full fifteen hundred dollars. We just give that a second to catch up. So you can see now that we've got the gross of fifteen hundred dollars. Tax is being calculated on the marginal rates. Sally still has a hundred dollars of salary sacrifice in there, and that's fine. There's nothing that um, that says that JobKeeper can't be um, salary sacrificed against. Um, in Sally's instance here, the leave wouldn't be um, accruing, but if you've got her set up as casual anyway, those items wouldn't have, have punched through there. So we're not no ordinary hours. You can actually even remove that completely from the the pay template or the pay run if you need. Um, and it's simply a JobKeeper top up and we'll hit save. Now they're really the main scenarios that you have with employees. So once you're actually finished with that, you can actually come back here and review your, um, your summary screen. And it's really easy to see at a glance that the, you've got two of your employees that have definitely been topped up to the $1,500 and you've got an employee who is already exceeding the $1,500. You can see quite easily here that tax has been withheld on each of the employees. And you can also see quite clearly here that there's been no super calculated on the earnings. The other thing that you may want to have a look at is the pay slips to see what information is going to be, going to be moving out to the employees. So at this point in time, um, James is fine. We know he was working. So for his perspective, nothing's actually changing on the pay slip. For Oliver, you can actually see quite clearly the um, JobKeeper payment top up that's on here. You can see the 38 hours that um, he did work. There's our 7.6 hours in public holidays. And you can also see that the stand down has been recorded as 30.4 hours with a, near, a, a zero pay rate. Now, one of the things that zero did change as part of this process is including zero value pay rates on pay slips prior to that, um, this stand down line would not have appeared on the zero pay slips. Um, and then obviously annual leave will be accruing. And if we move on to um, Sally, the only item that's sitting on her pay template or pay slip is the $1,500 top up that she's actually receiving. So once you're happy with everything, um, you know, you might want to pop a pay slip message in there if you like. Um, you can post your pay run, Yes, we want to post it. Obviously issue the pay slips out to the employees, download the ABA file or, or upload the, um, the payments to the bank. The most um, important part of the process then is actually filing this for STP purposes because all of the information that's in that pay run is actually going to be sent to the ATO to firstly um, inform the ATO that the individual was an eligible employee. Um, that the employee commenced JobKeeper from a specific fortnight um, and that they have actually received a, a minimum of $1,500 per employee per, per fortnight. Now, some of the questions that often come up are, um, what, if you're, um, what if you haven't already made the $1,500 per fortnight in the month of April? Um, our advice there, so as if, you, if you've already had pay runs in for April, that didn't meet the 1500. So if we come back here and have a look at perhaps this um, fortnightly pay run ending on the 1st of April. Um, all of these employees have earned their 1500, so that's fine. But if they hadn't, what I would do is an unscheduled pay run for that period, using just the JobKeeper top up to top them up to the required 1500 and then again, um, file that for STP reporting. So if you're talking about sequencing the actions, um, once you've determined that your, uh, your employer is eligible and that you are now needing to meet the employee requirements for, for payroll processing, I would actually start with the oldest pay run first and go through the process of um, doing an unscheduled pay run to top it up to the $1,500 if that's required file that pay run or, or post that pay run and then file that with STP. I would then go into the second pay period, so um, fortnight two, um, either process that pay run from scratch. So we've still you know, got people doing new pay runs for this particular period. Or if you've already processed a pay run for that second period, again, do an unscheduled pay run. And once that pay run has been posted, refile that pay run for STP purposes with the ATO. Um, any questions around that, Rochelle, that have come up so far? 
Yeah, there are plenty of questions coming through, Yes. Okay. Um, I might just go through them and answer them if you like. So once you have processed the pay run in the fortnight one, do you have to select the fortnight pay run every time you process the pay in zero? So I'm uh, working on the assumption that that question relates to when you're um, flagging an employee as a start, uh, when they start to be eligible. Um, the answer to that is no. The only time you need to do anything more with the employee record is if they are out of the, the job keeper subsidy. So as I said, if they've been terminated or the employment relationship has ended for whatever reason, that's when you would come back in here and it's having a go slow at the moment. Um, that's when you would come in here and flag that the, the stop um, job keeper for the employee. But um, as long as you've got them enrolled in the first instance, um, there is no need to make any other annotation around the employee. So if I jump back into enrol employees here, um, this is where you would just stop job keeper. You don't go back and edit it and say, yes, they're then in, in fortnight two and then in fortnight three and then in fortnight four. Once they're, they're in, they're in until they're, they're out again. So I hope that's answered your question. Um, what if payrolls process monthly and the payment for April is made on the 24th of the 4th for both, both fortnights? Should we select JobKeeper start code FN1 or FN2? So I would be selecting JobKeeper code FN1 because that is the first um, JobKeeper fortnight in which they become eligible. Continue with the processing of your pay runs as normal. I'm just going to share a, um, a pay run calendar screen here. So this document was issued by the Australian Taxation Office to the digital service providers, which are the software companies basically that are, are providing payroll services. And it directly relates back to single touch payroll. Um, and you can see it outlines the particular pay fortnight, so fortnight one right through to fortnight 13 and the end of the subsidy. And um, you will see that in the month of August, for a monthly cycle, there are actually three fortnightly ends within the month of August. If we flick over here and have a look at the information um, around payroll cycles, when it talks about monthly pays, it says at least $1,500 for each full JobKeeper fortnight within the month. So this will be $3,000 for each month except August the employer and, and August would then need to be 4,500 because it's got the three payroll fortnights in it. The employer may choose to pay 3,250 each month. So that's amortizing it out rather than having 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 4,500. So it's amortizing it out, but reimbursements are based only upon complete fortnights per month. So you don't have to change your monthly um, pay cycle back to fortnightly. You just need to understand that within each of those pay cycles, you've met the minimum requirement to pay $1,500 per employee per JobKeeper fortnight. And the reporting of that will actually be taken care of via the STP processing. So if you're, you're processing your, your monthly payroll, um, you will be filing that through to the ATO. Um, and all of the information that sits behind that will contain the information that the ATO actually needs to understand that it was a monthly pay cycle covering more than one pay period. Um, just out of, of interest, and I'm not sure whether um, people have actually seen that, this, we can jump into um, single touch payroll. Um, and let's see if it comes up on the demo file. It doesn't. Look, if, if you filed single touch payroll previously um, in any of your organisations, if you come up to payroll, single touch payroll, um, you'll actually get a list of all of the pay runs that have been filed by, S by STP. You can actually open those pay runs up and you'll see them in a CSV format. Um, it looks pretty messy, but it's actually quite logical. And as you scroll through, you'll actually see where the, the JobKeeper FN start codes come in and when the, the JobKeeper top up comes in. So you'll actually be able to see the type of information that is being filed via STP to the ATO to advise them that you're actually meeting the requirements of fortnightly um, pay periods. Um, can you print the payslip and see if the stand down hours show on the payslip? Yes, Deb, we've done that already. I can confirm that payslip, uh, sorry, stand down hours do actually appear on the payslips. 
Um, if a business has already paid a token pandemic leave last fortnight. Uh, so pandemic leave is actually unpaid, um, not paid leave. So annual leave, personal carers leave. If you've got an employee who was on any form of leave, uh, the JobKeeper subsidy um, is applied against that. So it's if uh, James, for instance, was on annual leave. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back to pay, pay run. Uh, so if we had an annual leave item in here, so instead of ordinary hours, say James was on 76 hours of annual leave, um, everything still applies. And if we just have a look at um, the next employee, so let's say Oliver Gray, for instance. So say Oliver in here, instead of having um, a public holiday, had 7.6 hours of unpaid pandemic leave, um, you would still need to top him up to the $1,500 for that pay period. Similarly, if he had 7.6 hours of annual leave or sick personal carers leave, you would still top up to the $1,500 for the respective pay period. Uh, so hopefully that's answered the question about um, pandemic leave. So pandemic leave is a type of approved leave. Um, do we set up eligible business participants, directors, trust, beneficiaries and payroll? If so, is the payment all top up? Uh, the answer to that question is no. Um, so there is no need to set eligible business participants up through payroll. When we're talking about a sole trader, when a sole trader registers for JobKeeper, uh, any payment made to them as a sole trader will be made to them as an individual. Um, if you're seeing or if the sole trader has selected to the, um, the business's bank account to have that payment made into, um, when that appears in the bank feed, I would be coding that straight to owner's drawings, sole trader drawings, um, because that will be identified separately for them at end of financial year when they do their tax returns. In terms of directors and trust beneficiaries, um, there's actually not, the payment is actually coming to the entity, not the individual. And the advice is that that's just going to be recorded as income into the entity. While we're talking about recording these transactions in the entity, I might just segue out a little bit and have a look at how we record the revenue or the JobKeeper subsidy that's actually received by the ATO. And we'll also talk a little bit about the cash flow boost subsidy as well. So simply the JobKeeper subsidy when it comes in is going to be flagged as other income. Um, give it a, a code, whatever code you want. Um, call it, I'm calling them COVID-19 um, JobKeeper subsidy. It will be BAS excluded. So it's out of scope for any form of GST reporting and also recording it as other income will um, exclude it. It's not included in, in, in any of the turnover figures that are used for any um, turnover assessments either. Simply save that and when the funds hit the bank account from the ATO, just code it straight to the, um, the JobKeeper subsidy revenue account. Now, if your, your client is um, receiving the cash flow boost as well, exactly the same process. Sorry, it's not sales, it's um, other income. Again, as excluded and save. So you've potentially got these two and, and you know, if you're in an environment where you're getting apprentice subsidies or state-based subsidies, same principles apply, just set them up as revenue. Now, if your client um, is in receipt of the cash flow boost, our recommendation uh, when that cash flow boost is applied to the um, ATO integrated client account, is actually simply recorded as a journal in the first in instance. And it will be recorded as cash flow boost. And let's just say they're receiving the full $10,000 for the first period. And we may not have an ATO integrated client account in here. Um, but we can create one quite easily.
you might want to enable payments to this account and post. And then when the, um, so obviously if you, you're working with a, um, an integrated client account, you will then need to reflect, um, or that will reflect the, the variance between what's due on the activity statement and, and the balance of the account. Any refunds that come back through will need to be um, posted then against the integrated client account to clear that balance out. So I hope that makes sense for everybody. Um, okay, I'm just going through the questions again, sorry. Do we set up eligible business participants? So hopefully we've answered that question around elig eligible business participants. Uh, no payroll, sole trader will get the, the funds paid directly to them. Um, directors and trust beneficiaries, it will be paid to the entity. And there's actually no requirement for the entity to pass that through to the individual. But if you do, you would record that as a, um, a director's loan or a beneficiary's loan if, if that was then being passed through to the individual. Uh, do stand down hours also relate to reduced hours? Um, you would need to confirm with the employer exactly uh, under what basis they have reduced an employee's hours. So if it's a, a, a contracted negotiation where they've basically entered into a new employment contract saying instead of doing 76 hours a fortnight, you're only going to be doing 50, um, that's very different from saying we still want to keep you employed at 76 hours, but we're going to stand you down for 16 of those hours. So. It, there's a subtle difference in that duty and I would recommend you need to, to go back to the employer and get it qualified whether or not there's been a contract amendment to reduce the hours or whether the employee, employee has been stood down for the reduced period of time. Um, when you apply the JobKeeper payment, the pay period already gone and the payroll already done, do we need to go back and change previous payroll? Some, Yes, as we said, um, if you have a already paid employees uh, in either fortnight one or fortnight two in April, and they are now eligible to receive JobKeeper payment and they didn't receive the $1,500, our advice is to go back and do an unscheduled pay run. Now, the only exception to that might be in period two, if you haven't already filed um, via STP, um, and then you've got the ability to revert that pay run back to draft and do the edits in that pay run. But um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of using the unscheduled pay runs to fix anything that wasn't correctly done in a prior, prior reporting period, or prior payroll period. Um, again, Teresa, I think we've answered that question a couple of times. What have you already processed the payroll? Um, client paid herself a lump sum for April in line with the 3,000 gross to fortnightly. Do we reverse the pay run and redo as two unschedules? Yes, I would, because it's all linked back to STP reporting. Um, and you will need to be able to show through the STP reporting that the employee was paid a minimum of $1,500 per JobKeeper pay fortnight. So yes, I would redo that as two unscheduled pay runs. Um, and you know, it doesn't matter that the payment date is uh, later than that. So one of the things that's worth being aware of is April is, is what's known as a transitional um, month. And the ATO have recognised that there's been very, very tight timelines around doing this, implementing, catching up payrolls. First pay periods have actually gone uh, before a lot of this information around eligibility, both for employers and employees, um, was, was made available. So what they've actually said is, um, you know, you should be enrolling your employer as soon as possible um, and identifying your eligible employees as soon as possible. Um, and they need to be paid the top up amount or the amount equivalent to, to two lots of $1,500, no later than the 30th of April. Now, there might be some situations where for whatever reason, you, you've not been able to finalise the registration of the employer. You still do have the ability to finalise that registration right through or to register actually right through to the end of May. However, you would still have been required to make the payment to the employees of the $1,500 per JobKeeper fortnight on or before the 30th of April. So, so be aware that in terms of paying employees um, to receive JobKeeper from fortnight one, uh, the critical date is the 30th of April. Um, and obviously the STP 
pay runs would need to be run for each of those periods. Um, but there is some flexibility in um, registering the employer. Now that's a little bit of a challenge when you're still perhaps doing turnover tests and things like that. But there are some employers that have made the decision to pay those job keeper top ups um, pending finalisation of um, their job keeper registration. Uh, employees have been stood down for 76 hours. Do I need to record 76 on the stand down and accrue leave on this? And then the other pay slip is 1500 job keeper. Also Easter public holidays were in there. Do they need to be paid those public holidays and then top them up? Yes, is the answer to that. So let's actually step through. That's a really great question. And I'm gonna go back into this, um, this particular pay run. Um, and I'm just going to revert it back to draft for, for the purposes. And I'm just going to have a look at James LeBron here. And I'm just going to reset James' pay slip because I think this should come through with um, Easter Monday on it. It does. Brilliant. Okay. So this is James. And, and James in this situation, as we said earlier, has worked above $1,500. Um, but let's just assume that James was one of these employees that has been stood down fully. So he um, will add the earnings line in of, of stand down that we actually talked about earlier. So we know that James has got no ordinary hours for this particular pay period. He's completely stood down. But you can see how Zero has actually already flagged in the, um, the public holidays. So Good Friday and Easter Monday. We can get rid of Easter um, Saturday and Easter Sunday because he only works Monday to Fridays. Um, we can say then that he has been stood down, uh, what is it, 76 minus 15.2, 60.8. So he's got his 60.8 worth of stand down hours. So we've got the total of the 76 here reflected between the public holidays. You can see the public holidays are being paid at his ordinary rate. Um, that's all flowing through with superannuation. Again, based on what we were talking about earlier, the leave will accrue based on the stand down hours plus the public holidays, which they would do, do normally. Um, and then we need to work out what the job keeper top up is for this particular pay period. And it's simply 1500 less the 306.84. Which is 11913.16. You can see now that that's topping James up to 1500. It will catch up with there. Again, superannuation is only calculating on the public holidays. It's not calculating on the job keeper payment. Um, and this will ensure that James's payroll records are, are correct and accurate. Um, obviously, if he'd taken annual leave in there, um, that would have been a line in there and your stand down hours would have reduced by whatever the annual leave or personal carers leave was. Um, and just adjust the, the JobKeeper payment top up accordingly. I need to make a, an emphasise point. There's been a couple of questions come around about whether JobKeeper is, so if the, the employee is earning already $1,500 or they're on annual leave and they're earning say $1,450, do we add another $1,500 to the top of that? So essentially giving them over two grand. The answer to that is no. It should be remembered right the way through the process that the JobKeeper payment is a subsidy against any normal payroll that's being processed. And if that normal payroll being processed doesn't equal $1,500 or more, then there's a requirement to use the top up to $1,500. So hopefully that's clarified that for you. Um, just going through some of the questions again. Answered that one. What if we have already processed payroll and not set up the JobKeeper enrolment in zero, but have with the ATO? So at this point in time, all you would have done with the ATO is registered the employer and as part of the employer registration, nominated the number of employees that would be um, deemed JobKeeper eligible employees. What you can do in that instance is you come back into zero, uh, you come into the pay employees, navigate to the payroll support page here, come in here and enroll the employees. If you've already processed pay runs, once you've enrolled the employees, 
um, do an unscheduled pay run for that period for nil, but select all of the employees in the pay run, but process their payroll as nil. And what that will actually do is, is send the STP flag updates through to zero, or alternatively, you can leave it until the next period. Um, actually, no, file the, the unscheduled pay run for the, the payroll period. Um, just had an employee resign and doesn't want JobKeeper have already enrolled through the portal, including the employee. Do I just adjust this accordingly through the pay run specifying final pay and lodge STP? And yes, and that's a situation where you would come back in here and then also identify the stopped period as well. So that will then send a flag through to the ATO that that employee has stopped being eligible for um, payroll, uh, for JobKeeper subsidy. Um, the other thing to be aware of is part of the, the JobKeeper subsidy process. So we, we've got at the moment in the month of April where um, determining whether our employers are eligible and enrolling them in JobKeeper as an eligible employer. We're determining whether or not we've got eligible employees. So there's the nomination forms going out for that. Part of the um, enrolment process for the employer is nominating the number of, of staff that are eligible employees. We're then processing the pay runs. The final step in that is actually going to be a monthly declaration that's going to be required by all businesses. And the monthly declaration, I'll just pull this over here. Um, so each month you must reconfirm your reported eligible employees. And this is done through either the business portal of the clients doing it directly themselves or via their registered tax or BAS agents. Um, and this is also one of the places you can notify your eligible employees whether they've changed or left employment. However, if you've been filing correctly through STP, when you review this data, it should be accurate. Um, obviously, none of us have actually seen this go live yet, but the, the data that will be sitting in here for you to basically verify at this point in time is data that's actually going to be utilised or be pulled through the STP lodgement process. So this in essence will almost be the last check and balance um, that you've got before you're making your monthly declaration. Um, as part of that, you also do need to provide you the, the turnover for the current month. So when we do the declaration in May, it will be for um, April and you'll also have to put projected turnover in there for May. Now, just to note, that's not retesting eligibility. So once you've been deemed eligible as an employer, you are in. Um, a change in turnover or increases won't, won't see you removed. But it's this process, once you've made this monthly declaration, that will be the trigger and the, the notice to the ATO to start remitting payments back to the employers for JobKeeper subsidy. Um, how are we going for time, Rochelle? Uh, about six minutes till two. Cool, I'll keep going through questions. Um, okay, Sheila's saying she came back with an error. All right, Sheila, you might need to deal with that directly with zero support. I've heard of a couple of people that have had errors and I don't know what they, they are at the moment. So without looking at specifically what you've done, I can't respond. I would go through zero support to, um, to resolve that. Um, if an employee is terminated halfway in the fortnight, do we still no, we pay the full $1,500, but again, if they're terminated halfway through the fortnight, um, there would be a termination pay. So if that termination pay is less than $1,500, you would do a JobKeeper top up to $1,500. If it's more than $1,500, there's no additional amounts that need to be paid. Um, we pay monthly. I think I've gone through the monthly, so we've covered that. Um, does the JobKeeper top up need to be included in remuneration for work cover and payroll tax? They're actually two um, questions that are, are unresolved at this point in time. Um, and as you're aware, work cover and payroll tax are state-based determinations, not federal-based determinations. Our advice at this point in time is to um, contact the individual state authorities. Um, I've not seen any specific guidance around that come out at this point in time. Uh, if there are no adjustments in Fortnite 1, are we required to file the pay run again, e.g.? Only if um, when you filed it originally for STP purposes, 
um, none of the JobKeeper codes were in there. So if you'd filed it prior to setting up the employee as a JobKeeper eligible employee and using the JobKeeper top-up that we looked at earlier, um, just file and uh, redo an unscheduled pay run for that period and just basically refile. Um, if I bring an employee back mid-May, do I need to pay them JobKeeper just from when they start or am I supposed to back pay them to the start of April? We pay weekly. So JobKeeper eligibility um, is the employee must have been employed as at the 1st of March um, and they must have been, or if they were a casual, uh, they needed to have also had 12 months as at the 1st of March as well. So if the, per if the employee was terminated after the 1st of March, and you make the decision to bring them back in the middle of May, unless you're choosing to, um, to back pay, which you're probably not going to be able to do, you would only pay them JobKeeper from the point that they became eligible with you again. Um, you would need to have a look at the Fair Work website. There's some provisions in there about re-employment um, for the purposes of JobKeeper, and they would generally need to be re-employed um, with you on a permanent or a full-time full -time basis. Um, so no, there would be no requirement to back, back pay them. Um, but what's the pay super on the employees? Original pre-JobKeeper wage over a thousand. So you've got a client who wants to pay the employee the 750 a week, but wants to pay the super on the employee's original pre-JobKeeper wage. Is this allowable or possible in zero? So the question there is, um, is the employee earning that $1,000? Because super guarantee is on ordinary time earnings. So if you're not working ordinary time earnings or those ordinary time earnings aren't being flagged because an employee is on um, annual leave or personal leave or other uh, personal carers leave or other authorized paid leave, um, you've really got no ordinary time earnings to pay the super on. So you could certainly make a decision to pay super on $1,000 a week if the employee is not receiving the $1,000, but you still want to pay the equivalent super. Um, in that situation, I would set up and, and I'll just jump back into a pay, pay run there. And hopefully this, um, this supports the, the example that you're trying to put through, just so I'm, I'm really clear. So let's say James is our employee and he normally earns $1,000 a week, um, but for whatever reason, he's, uh, we'll just reset James's pay slip in here. He's earning $1,000 a week. Um, he's fully stood down. We're just going to ignore public holidays at the moment. So he's got no ordinary hours in here. Um, he stood down for the full 76 hours. He's earning, uh, he's getting his JobKeeper top up for the 70, uh, sorry, for the $1,500. And what you're asking is that if James had normally been earning $1,000, he would have been getting the 9.5% on that. In that situation, I would add a superannuation line in manually and it wouldn't actually be superannuation guarantee because don't forget superannuation guarantee is very specific to ordinary earnings. It would be an additional employer contribution because the employer is making the decision to pay, um, to pay this additional amount. And uh, there it is and you would put it in, uh, in fact, you'd probably pop it in as a fixed amount, not a percentage of earnings. So $1,000 times, I should know what this is, shouldn't I? $95 is what I would be putting in there for the superannuation. Um, and that makes sure, makes it really, really clear that it's actually not superannuation guarantee. Um, and you may need to pop a note on the pay, pay slip saying, you know, super being paid because, you know, we're kind and loving people or whatever the reason is. Um, so yes, I would be flagging that as an employer additional contribution. And don't forget, because it is an employer additional contribution that will be reported through as risk at the end of the year as well. So is it allowable possible? Um, absolutely, and it's doable in zero as we've just stepped through. Uh, weekly pay run usually on a Monday. Next Monday is a public holiday, so pay run gets processed on a Friday. Um, so Friday today will be the twenty. 
So what's this Friday? Where are we in April? So you're saying that normally you would pay this on the 27th, which would fall into period three. Um, but in this situation, because of the public holiday, it's falling into period two. Um, when you do your pay run, the pay run will reflect that it is from the 13th to the next Monday is a public holiday, so parent gets processed on Friday. So if your pay run is for the period the 20th to the 26th and is being paid on the 27th, the STP lodgement will, will show that the pay run is for that period. So it should fall into that period. Rochelle, I might take that question on notice actually, um, if that's possible, just to qualify, because it should still qualify as, as JobKeeper Fortnight 2, not JobKeeper Fortnight 3, um, because it, it relates to the period of JobKeeper Fortnight 3. No problem, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, for April only, could we do one unscheduled pay run with a top up for both fortnights? Uh, my recommendation is that you do an unscheduled pay run per fortnight. That ensures that the STP recording is actually correct uh, because it'll be the STP lodgements that the ATO will be reviewing to determine eligibility. Uh, do I need to, no, you don't need to create a JobKeeper pay calendar. Uh, there is actually no requirement to alter any of your pay cycles or pay calendars. The only exception to that would be is if you've got an employee on a quarterly pay calendar. So we work with a client who um, who draws money out during the month or the, the three months. And then at the end of the quarter, we review what he's drawn out. We do a gross up on it um, so that PAYGW is recorded correctly um, and also super is recorded. We've moved that process now to a monthly process rather than a quarterly process to meet the monthly reporting requirements. But irrespective of whether you've got a um, payroll calendars that are weekly, fortnightly or monthly, there's no need to change any of the cycles uh, within your, your pay calendars. Uh, we pay monthly in arrears on the second of the month for the previous month. Exactly the same. So flag the payment date will be um, what will determine the JobKeeper fortnight that it falls into. So as long as you've met, um, when you're submitting the, the pay run, it will have a pay date. Um, and it's if the pay date falls within the JobKeeper period, you're actually covered. Um, if somebody works reduced hours every week and has earned under 15, do we just use the JobKeeper top up? Yes, quite simply, if they're working uh, reduced hours every week and they're not earning the 1500 as a consequence of that, just use the JobKeeper top up to to um, top up the delta. Uh, is it worked hours plus stand down hours at zero plus the JobKeeper? Again, that would depend on whether they have been formally stood down or what the reason for the reduction of the hours is. And you might need to speak uh, seek independent fair work advice on that if you're unsure. Um, we paid a token amount to employees or casual last fortnight before JobKeeper was a thing. Do we need to top up to 1500? Thinking we do an unscheduled pay run to reverse out, then do a new one for the full 1500. Yes, that's actually a great way of handling it. Um, reverse it out and do a full, full one for the 1500. So basically the thing to keep in mind is if you have an eligible employee, uh, whether they're earning, you know, they're being paid $0 for the, the fortnight or they're being paid um, $30 for the fortnight or $1,450, they still need to be topped up to the $1,500. If the pay runs are weekly under the $750 for the last three weeks, could you do one unscheduled pay run for the shortfall of the JobKeeper payment? No, so weekly is an interesting one. And what you can do, so in, in most JobKeeper fort, well in the JobKeeper fortnights, what you'll have is basically two pay dates that actually fall within, or two payment dates, that fall within the, the JobKeeper um, fortnight. What you can do is do a top up in the second week of the JobKeeper fortnight. So assuming, uh, and if we go back to the, um, the PDF we've got here, so let's just assume that um, you're on a weekly and your paydays are on the, the 3rd and the 10th. So you've processed your payroll for the, the payment date of the 3rd of April, um, and the employee may have only earned um, $600 in that period. Uh, you do your next weekly pay and they might have earned $700 or, or $800. 
So between the two pay periods, the weekly pay periods, they've actually earned fourteen hundred dollars. What you would do in in the second week is actually top up a hundred because remember the the criteria is a minimum of fifteen hundred dollars per pay period. It's actually not a minimum of seven hundred fifty dollars per week if you're on a weekly cycle. So hopefully that's qualified and answered that question for you. Um, we are estimating a drop of more than. 30% in the quarter ending June, but so far monthly for has not dropped enough. Do we go ahead and back pay? No. So if um, at this point in time, you do not meet the eligibility requirements to be registered from the 30th of March, um, you will look at uh, registering in a later period and you will only commence payment, um, job keeper payment from the period in which you get, um, you're re eligible to be registered. So again, if, if you know your turnover is good in May, your turnover is good. It, turnover is good in April. Turnover is good in May, but everything goes pear shaped in June, and that's the period that you are um, seeing the decline or nominating as the decline period. Then your job keeper payments will only occur from June moving forwards. So basically, any time within the thirteen week or thirteen fortnight period, um, you may meet the eligibility criteria. And at that point in time is when you will be eligible to, um, to nominate. It could be that you don't meet that until you get to September, which means that you're eligible for JobKeeper for the last two weeks of September only. Uh, trust beneficiary that's not an employee. I've registered the trust. How would the ATO know that the trust beneficiary needs the JobKeeper payment? Uh, that should have been part of the registration process for the trust beneficiary. You would have nominated who they are. Um, and as I said earlier, the payment from the ATO for JobKeeper will be paid directly back through the entity. So the, the trust bank account that was nominated will be in receipt of it. Um, it's up to the entity, and this is a really, really interesting discussion at the moment, because there's actually no requirement for the entity. So if it's a trust or a company, and we're talking about um, eligible individuals rather than eligible employees, there's actually no requirement for the, the entity to then pass that payment onto the individual. So, um, you know, th there could be a number of different ways about how that's dealt with from an individual perspective, but fundamentally the entity will receive the income for that and what they decide to do with it um, in relation to the individual is up to them. Um, already paid fortnightly wages in April, not set up JobKeeper. Okay, I think we've qualified that. We've answered that one a few times. Cash flow boost has been actioned against the January to March bad, so the client only receives the net amount. Yes, that's correct. So cash flow boost, if um, your client was a quarterly lodger, would have been determined against the um, March PAYG and would have been offset against the liability for the March bad. So there may still have been a residual that was required to be paid. You'll generally find that any of the lodges that were monthly lodges, uh, it may, by the time they get the cash flow boost related to the PAYGW and it's March multiplied by three, um, that may put the March period in credit, which is when you'll see that credit trigger back to the, um, the business's bank account. If paying monthly in March, paid on the 31st of third, does this fall into the first job keeper fortnight? Yes, it does. It, it does. And I've had a couple of questions around that. So if the payment date was the 31st of March, that will fall into the JobKeeper first fortnight. Um, just make sure it's topped up to the $1,500. Uh, can I see the revenue journal again, please, for coding? Um, I might get Rochelle to send the, the revenue coding out rather than showing that here again, if that's okay. No problem, Tess. We'll catch up after this. And we'll catch us yeah, later. lovely. Thank you. Um, power of the other, do you know about revenue? Yes, you do. I think we've answered that one a few times already. Can you do another unscheduled? Yes, you can do another unscheduled pay run to fix an unscheduled pay run. Um, that's not uncommon, uh, particularly where businesses themselves have gone in and done pay runs and tried to fix it and completely messed it up again. So there's no restriction on the number of unscheduled pay runs you can have for a particular pay period. And unscheduled pay runs are often the best way to fix things. Um, and I, I tend to often do two. So depending on what the, the error is that needs to be corrected, and this isn't necessarily just even related to JobKeeper, this is just zero day-to-day um, -day ops. If there's an error in a pay run, I will generally use an unscheduled pay run to reverse it out. And then I will do another unscheduled pay run to process it correctly. It just, from my perspective, provides a nice audit trail and you're able to use the pay slip notes to um, 
pop in a reason why you've done what you've done. Uh, everyone was already paid their 1500 minimum, that's fabulous. Um, you will still need to make sure that your STP filing is done uh, against pay items using the, uh, sorry, against the STP codes for JobKeeper. So if the pay runs were processed even up to the 1500 before um, the STP side of things was updated in zero, you will need to do a refile on that to um, make sure the STP codes flow through for JobKeeper purposes. Um, the figures are different. When I've done a PL against the JobKeeper calculator, uh, check whether you're doing your PL on cash or accruals and whether you're comparing that against the JobKeeper calculator on cash and accruals. Also check the GST treatment of some of the transactions because I said at the beginning the um, calculator will only pick up GST free and GST on income. So um, what I've seen is, is often there are um, different tax treatments, GST treatments on some of the transactions. Employee before the payment has been made to the employer. Yes, so the whole purpose of JobKeeper is it is a reimbursement to the employer. So the employer must have made the payment to the employee um, in advance of the reimbursement from the ATO. Uh, so part of the declaration process that you'll be signing, both when you sign in and also the monthly declaration, will be I have made the required payments to the employees. If you sign that and say yes, and you in fact haven't, you're making a false declaration and um, the ATO will come after you with a very big stick. Uh, what if I've already paid the top up but couldn't lodge the STP because client hadn't signed up yet, employee start date not nominated, that's all happening today. That's great. You know, once it's all been signed up and you've done what you need to do, then file the STP, that will be fine. Uh, the second fortnightly pay run is actually on the 30th of April. So if we're looking at the calendar here, the 30th, that falls into fortnight three. So I would say that you've already had a pay run on the 16th, which would have been fortnight two, and a pay run that it was paid on the 2nd of April, which would be what was considered fortnight one. Uh, contributing company director is set up as an employee. Do we treat their processing for JobKeeper as per normal other employees earning? Yes, we do. So if you've got a com company director or a, a trust beneficiary who's normally on payroll and gets paid payroll as per any other employee, then they're to be treated as any other employee in terms of um, a minimum of $1,500 per fortnight. Uh, JobKeeper higher value for the monthly payroll scenario, the one where if we pay extra JobKeeper stimulus each month, we have allowed for three fortnights that will occur in August. Okay, so let's just assume that um, James here was on a monthly payroll. Um, depending on how you wanted to do it, where's our JobKeeper top up? So what you could do is you could either in um, April, make sure he receives $3,000. And if you have a look at the, if we pull the calendar back up again here, you'll see that um, the only month that's actually got three pay fortnights in it is August. So if you were processing through, oops, where are we James? Um, you could do 3,000, 3,000, 3,000 in April, 3,000 in May, June, July, and in August, you would then uh, make this 4,500. 4,500. Or you could pay 3,250. So if we're looking at it, it's some um, 13 JobKeeper fortnights, which is 13 multiplied by 1,500. So the total amount to the employee is $19,500. And the way they're reverse engineering that is it's basically going one, two, three, four, five, six, dividing. 19,500 divided by six is what gives you the 3,250 if you wanted to amortize it across the whole JobKeeper period. On STP Weekly, we paid JobKeeper top up yesterday, filed the pay run, but it failed as we've not registered all employees. We've not registered all employees. Um, not quite sure about the question that's actually being asked, Sue, about 
uh, do we need the ATO forms received? I'm not quite sure what you've actually done in zero or not done in zero. Um, if you've had a pay run that's failed, it may be worth contacting zero directly about that because they'll be able to step through all of the, the elements that you've done. Uh, recording additional hours agreed to work on top of normal hours previously worked because of increased pay due to job tick keep job keep it top up that's fine as well so say you had an employee that was normally um, working 15 hours and there's been an agreement that's been come to with the employee so an employer can't force an employee for increased hours um, they can actually have a, a discussion and a negotiation with them but if suddenly now um, the employee is now working 30 hours all you would do is is find out what the difference is in the job keeper top up and, and do it that way. So, you know, when an employee works any time, it's either ordinary hours, it's overtime hours, um, it's annual leave or personal carers leave. Um, you just treat it as you would normally if the employee worked increased hours. So, you know, if it is overtime that they're working um, in accordance with the award requirements, then process the normal pay as you would normally and whatever's left over between what they're, they're getting in the 1500 is what becomes or what what forms your job keeper payment to top up. Um, the ATO has, not the ATO, sorry, Fair Work has an excellent website um, around coronavirus. So if you're not already across this resource, I highly recommend it. Uh, this is the main page on coronavirus and Fair Work. And if you do scroll down a bit, there is a link specifically to the JobKeeper changes in the Fair Work Act. And this will tell you everything that an employer is able to and not able to do with an employee who is actually deemed eligible for JobKeeper purposes. Um, so it talks about directions to reduce hours, change usual duties, working different days and times, agreements to take annual leave and those sorts of things. But that doesn't preclude an employee and employer coming to an agreement that they may increase their hours. The important point to note though is they cannot force an employee to increase their hours. Um, I think we've answered that about revising prior entries from ordinary earnings, unscheduled pay runs. Um, if a client expects the turnover will drop in May or June, can they now? The three turnover tests that actually need to be met at the moment, so if you're on the ATO website, um, you have a look at the turnover tests and it'll be the basic test that they're looking to meet at this point in time. Um, and they're looking at March 2020 or April 2020. And if they're qualifying at a later time, it needs to be registered from that later period of time. So unless they can say now that the revenue is going to drop for the, the, the projected revenue is going to decrease for the April to June quarter, then they're actually not eligible. If um, they get to May and they're able to say, well, hang on a sec, we you know, things have gone worse than we expected them to do. So we're now estimating we've been okay for April, we've been okay for, for May, but June's actually going to fall off the wagon. They can then choose to, to register from the June period moving forward. Um, if parents are on the alternate fortnight, how do I fix this to top up the JobKeeper amount? Um, quite simply, you look at the calendar where the date is. So for instance, your, your payment dates might have been on the uh, let's say the 1st of April and the 15th of April, as long as on the 1st of April you can say that there was a $1,500 payment and then on the 15th of April there was a $1,500 payment, um, you don't need to change anything at all. So it will look at the pay period. It, your, your pay period doesn't have to meet these dates exactly. It's the payment date that falls within any day within the pay period will determine which JobKeeper fortnight that it fits into. So hopefully that's answered that question for you. Uh, do closely held employees qualify for JobKeeper? Yes, they do. If so, would you have to pay them on a fortnightly basis? Absolutely. Um, so uh, I had heard yesterday, I believe, that the requirement for closely held to be starting to utilise uh, STP from 1 July 2020 has been deferred to 2021. Um, I don't have a reference to that at this point in time. 
However, the easiest way to do this for closely held employees would be to bring them on onto a pay run now. Um, now there may be some concerns around that where um, the employee's wage isn't normally declared until tax planning or tax treatment is done at end of financial year. In that situation, I would recommend liaising with the client's accountant regarding that one. Uh, first pay date is the 1st of 4th, which relates to work being done in March. Is an unscheduled pay run required? To add? Yes, it will be. So again, it's about the payment date, 1st of March, uh, sorry, 1st of April, if that's your payment date, you would want that to be falling into the first job keeper fortnight. So yes, you'll need to do a top up to $1,500. Fundamentally, over the, the period, assuming that your client is eligible from the, um, the 30th of March, um, it's, it's a rebate per employee, who, assuming they all stay for the, the duration, of 19500 So it, it really doesn't matter what your pay cycle is. At the end of the, the, the scheme, you will, your business will have been in receipt of a subsidy equivalent to $19,500 per employee. Um, can an employee receive both JobKeeper and Apprentice support payments? Uh, no, they can't. can't. So um, as part of the um, employer registration process, um, they need to identify eligible employees and an employee, uh, an apprentice may be deemed to be an eligible employee and will need to be registered for JobKeeper. If they are an eligible employee and registered for JobKeeper, then the apprentice support payments for them will cease from the period they become eligible for JobKeeper. So that's something you would need to liaise with the, um, the apprentice authority on because they're actually um, looking at that. The employer retired as at 31st of March, would they receive JobKeeper for the first fortnight? Pay run was on the 2nd of April. Um, we might come back to you on that question if that's okay, Jen. Can we flag that one as an another question, please, Rochelle? Yep, sure, Cass. Lovely, thank you. Um, doesn't need to refile. Okay, if employees are paid over 1500 in the previous pay run, it doesn't need to be refiled with the ATO with job keep it and roll label label right. It does need to be refiled. So if the you've already filed via STP, but you haven't if we go back to the, the payroll and the um, setup requirements. So assuming you've already filed by STP, but you haven't enrolled your employees in here, you need to come in and enroll your employees and then um, do an unscheduled pay run to basically refile that, that payment period. So unless these codes go through, the ATO doesn't know that you've actually made payment. Now you would have the opportunity when you do the monthly review to um, potentially add them in here, but the easiest way is to utilise the ST STP functionality within Xero. I think we've addressed the issue of payment dates a number of times, so I'm just going to jump over that one. Yes, so the questions come up, what if you have already processed wages with just the JobKeeper top up and no stand down hours or public holiday and you filed STP, can you revert to draft and fix this and refile with, with the ATO? Um, yes is the answer to that question. So if the pay run that you're talking about is the last filed pay run, you can revert that pay run back to draft and make the corrections that you need to make, um, post the pay run again, and then refile uh, that for STP purposes. If it's not the latest pay run, and you know if you're using Xero when you go into pay employees, there's actually a flag on each of the pay run calendars about which the latest um, pay run actually is. So if this is the latest and it's not been filed, yes, you can edit that pay run and um, make the changes that you need to make and then file that for STP purposes. If it's not the latest pay run, you will need to do an unscheduled pay run to make any corrections and then file as an unscheduled pay run. Payday is the relevant date, not the pay period it relates to. That's what it says. Yes, you're correct, Elke. It is the, um, the pay date. What we're going to get clarification on, though, is the pay date that is um, changed as a consequence of public holidays. So thank you for raising that question. It is the payment date that is relevant, not the pay period. 
Uh, non-employee directors, so if they're a non-employee director, then they can register as an eligible business individual um, and information on registering them is on the, the ATO website. Uh, a non-employee director doesn't get processed through payroll. Um, you can pay it by Monday, is that the day? The JobKeeper top-up payments need to be paid by the 30th of April, and that's only for the month of April. Uh, and the question is, is it the payment was transferred from the business bank account or the date the pay was received on the employee's bank account? Um, public holidays, Mondays, banks and transfers. Look, I, I don't think the ATO will be unreasonable as long as you can demonstrate that you have made the payment on that date. So making the payment is actually seeing that the funds have left your bank account, um, which is if you're making the payment on the, the Friday or the Saturday or the Sunday, is, is going to be able to demonstrate that, even though it may not hit the employee's bank account on, until the Monday or Tuesday. Um, employee is on leave without pay by choice. Do I need to enrol in JobKeeper now and top up? Leave without pay by choice is an interesting phrase. So um, an employee cannot choose to be on leave without pay unless the employer has authorised it. Um, so if the employees just said, hey, I'm not coming to work, I'm on leave without pay, um, unless the employer says, okay, I'm authorising that, then technically um, they've abandoned their employment. So this is one of those areas, it's a really interesting discussion and I would suggest that um, if you've got an employee in this situation, you do seek uh, independent HR and, and fair work advice on it. But if an employee is on approved leave, uh, whether that's paid or unpaid leave, then yes, they do, and they're eligible employees, they yes, they do need to be topped up to the $1,500. The question is whether or not they're on approved leave when we're talking about leave without pay. So please um, seek advice specific to your workplace regarding that. That includes maternity leave, Cass? Uh, yes, it does. So maternity leave is, is approved leave, except if they're in receipt of um, paid parental leave. So if an employee is already receiving paid parental leave, they will not be um, eligible to receive JobKeeper. They may become eligible at a later date uh, once they, they cease paid parental leave. Um, and it's also dad and, and partner leave in there as well. Um, if they're on unpaid maternity leave, and again, any type of leave, we're talking about authorised leave, um, then yes, they would um, be required to be topped up to the $1,500. Um. I think we've answered the questions is about fortnights. Uh, uh, so the question is about employer eligibility and turnover tests. If they're using the estimate quarter April to June 19 and 20, because April 20 is not quite 30%, but on the way down, does this mean that the client can claim from March 30th? Yes, that is correct. So if we come back in here to the, um, the turnover tests, uh, and this is a great document, so please have a read and step through it. Uh, if they can demonstrate and that the turnover for the, uh, the um, predicted turnover, oh, sorry, uh, for the April to June quarter is going to be 30% lower than the same period last year, um, then yes, that makes them eligible to register from the 30th of March. Payment date for fortnight pay was on the 10th of April, so the second one will be on the 1st of May. Again, let's go back to the calendar. If it was on the a payment date for a fortnightly pay was on the 10th of April, um, I'm not quite sure why it would slide to the 1st of May because the next fortnight in that cycle is the 24th of April. So um, that that's I'm a little bit unsure about what the question is there. If it was paid on the 10th of April, it fits into fortnight one. If it's paid on the 1st of May, um, you've somehow or other skipped a week in there. So I think um, go back and have a look at things and qualify, requalify that. To trigger this to be flowing correctly, or do you have to do an unscheduled for each week? Um, you should be fine to do the unscheduled for the second week, but just on the prudent side, I would do it for both weeks in order, um, just to make sure. Um, 
No. So the question is, when we start JobKeeper for an employee, it asks to select the fortnight he becomes eligible. Do we need to choose the fortnight in which we started to process JobKeeper and make the unscheduled pay run for the previous period? So the uh, employee eligibility side of things. If we come back to this. So if you are saying when you enrol your employee here and you're starting JobKeeper that they are eligible for, and this has come up because I've um, got a process pay run in here, but it would have had fortnight one in here. So if you're saying they are eligible from fortnight one, you select fortnight one and they must have a, a payment that matches fortnight one. So hopefully that's that's answered that question there. Um, if wages were paid on the 31st of March, will that count? Yes, we've answered that one. Wages paid on the 31st of March will count as the first fortnight. Um, if you've registered each employee at the time of the ATO, do you still need to set up? So at the moment, you actually, um, you're not registering any physical employee in the ATO process. All you're doing when you're um, registering an, as an eligible employer with the ATO is making a statement on the number of employees that will be eligible for JobKeeper. There's no employee details that are being made. It's actually this process here in zero which will finalise the registration of the employee. So just because you've um, um, done the employer registration with ATO, they've got no idea until you file this information through STP who those employees actually are. Um, if the client hasn't paid their employee in April, can they make the full 3000 as one payment prior to the 30th of April? Yes, so April is the only exception to the, um, to the rule about um, uh, making sure the payment date was in the pa is within the pay period. Uh, and that's because they recognise April. So as long as the 3000 is paid to the employee by the end of April for the two first pay periods or pay fortnights, then yes. Any other, so you couldn't make April's payment, for instance, on the 1st of May. Um, you couldn't make the, again, if we go back to the matrix here of, of dates, so uh, say we're looking at the payroll period here to the 24th of May, and your pay run ends on the 21st of May, and you would normally pay on the 22nd of May. If you make that payment on the 25th of May, you haven't actually met the eligibility requirements to pay the employee in the required JobKeeper fortnight and that payment will then count towards this fortnight. So in, in essence, you will miss a fortnight's worth of, um, of subsidy. Um, can we close out to JobKeeper? Can today can include it in Monday's payday to pay 3,000? Yes, that's correct, Elke. I think we've just answered that question about back paying in April. Okay, so in my example, Oliver, it started in July 19. Yes, we were working in a demo file. I wasn't actually looking at whether the employee technically was eligible. It was more about how do we process through uh, the payroll. So if you have an employee who is not eligible, you just simply don't select them um, to start job keepers, job keeper. So if we look at Sally Martin, for instance, here in the um, example, um, she's a full-time, employee, if she was a casual and she only started on the 31st of December, um, she wouldn't be an eligible employee, so we wouldn't enrol in the JobKeeper fortnight. So just understand that when we've been looking at some of the data in here, it is test data. I'm not making a determination from the ATO's perspective about whether they're eligible or not. I've just worked on the assumption for this um, example that all of the employees were eligible for JobKeeper. Um, alrighty, there's one other question that is outstanding around real estate agents who receive an advance on the first of each month and then commission due less advance at month end. Um, can we take that question on notice as well, if that's okay? I don't have clarity around that one at this point in time. Wow, well done, Cass. What a marathon. Um, we've just got one more from Julie Ward, but I think we'll um, draw a line in the sand there. Um, would give us some input about HR advisors. 
Yeah, they ended up being really expensive. Um, so I would, I mean, we've got we've got our connection with the AB Phillips team, um, but yeah, I, I didn't end up going ahead with the lawyer because um, it, it just I think you maybe seek reach out to um, others locally might be better advice. Um, well, thanks so much, Cass. It's invaluable information for everybody. Um, I think we might call it an afternoon there. Um, and FYI, this will be, um, well, has been recorded and will be uploaded to um, the AAT website amongst all of the other COVID-19 related resources. Anything else from you, Cass? No, I think that's it for me. Um, probably my last piece of advice is don't panic around all of this. Um, Xero has fabulous instructions around it, so you'll find those under payroll pay employees and simply visiting their payroll support page. So there's a lot of information in here. You'll also see there's some other elements that they are actually um, working on. So, you know, don't hesitate to come and revisit the page. Um, but if you just logically follow all of these steps through here, um, everything will actually flow nicely. Don't worry about, you know, trying to readjust pay periods. It's, it's linked back to the, the physical pay date. Um, just, you know, step through it and it will actually fall into place for you. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for that, Cass. Um, we'll call it quits there and end the session. Um, and I hope I'll have this up by Monday. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thanks, everyone.